when it's like, well, I don't want to be right. Like, I want you to do something about it. Yeah. Duh. (laughs) I'm not saying this to make you feel bad. You know, I want you to do something about it. But at the end of the day, all those years I spun my wheels, he's got to want it more than I do. You're listening to the Nacho Kids Podcast, where we discuss all things step family related, real stories, real people, real help. Your hosts are the creators of the Nacho Kids Method and the Nacho Kids Academy Step Family Coaching Team, Lori and David Sims. Welcome to episode 147 of the Nacho Kids Podcast. That's right. <laughs> hey, David. Oh, you sound sad. I am sad. Um, why are you sad? Because I got COVID brain. <laughs> Last night, we were going to have hot dogs, and I looked in the refrigerator, and I said, I know I bought some, could not find them, and then you were getting ready to go to the store, and I opened the refrigerator again, and boom, there they were, right in front of my face, like eye level in front of my face. Maybe they weren't there before. Well, I'm not going to call it brain fog. I'm going to call (laughs) it brain block. Well, what was your excuse pre-COVID? David. (laughs) And then I got this nasty headache I can't get rid of, and it's driving me batty. It kept me awake last night. That's how bad it was. You're talking in your sleep keeps me awake. You were talking to yours last night. What was I saying? What was her name? (laughs) David. (laughs) You know what? As long as you let me sleep, it don't matter what her name was. (laughs) You just kept going, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, then. I ain't never that agreeable. I know. It must have had it involve a woman. (laughs) Besides me. (laughs) Anyway, if any of you are out there fighting COVID brain, I feel your pain. It's not good. Go ahead. What? I figured you were going to rhyme something else since you did the brain in pain. (laughs) Oh, no. See, I didn't even catch that. That's how off kilter I am right now. (laughs) Yeah, it's terrible. Well, the good thing is, though, if you don't remember some things, then maybe I can get away with more. No. It's amazing how COVID brain is selective. <laughs> I'll start using that when you, you say something to me. I'm like, you don't remember that? You do that already. <laughs> <laughs> what was your excuse pre-COVID brain? <laughs> Let's announce our winner of the Nacho Kids Academy Scholarship, courtesy of Linda Dunham. Let's do it. The winner this week is... Ashley M. Yay, Ashley. What is that? (laughs) See, that was the drum roll after announcing. Oh, gosh. That's me hitting myself in the head, y'all. It's probably why my head hurts. Not only was the drum roll after the announcement, (laughs) but it sounded like you were in the Mexican restaurant with the hat on your head. (laughs) And it's your birthday. It's your birthday. Free free nachos. It's your birthday. (laughs) We're going to party like it's your birthday. (laughs) Okay. Now that we have the winner out of the way. Okay. Check one. (laughs) We are supposed to talk about chores because we started to talk about them last week and then we got sidetracked with tit for tat. Okay. Okay. So let's use you and I for an example. Okay. And don't make any smart comments about Jackson and chores. This is a (laughs) hypothetical situation. Okay. You make it sound like Jackson and chores go in the same sentence. David, (laughs) stop making my life difficult. All right. Carry on. Okay. So let's just say that I have Jackson full time, except every other weekend, which I do. And let's just say your kids came every other weekend. And that was it. Not 50-50, every other weekend. Okay. And every other weekend, I was adamant that they should do chores, including cleaning the bathroom. And I would say but they're only here four days a month. Why are they doing chores to clean up for all the other days when they're not here? But don't you want them to have responsibility, David? I do. So how are they going to get that responsibility if you're not going to give them responsibility four days a month when they're at their mom's and she doesn't require them to do chores? Um, I'm certainly not going to make them, um, you know, maids in my house when they come because that's all they're going to remember. Is that every time they come to dad's house, they got to do all these chores. It's not fair because they're not here the other days of the month. So I'm going to find some other ways to do it. And I'm 
I don't think people necessarily learn how to say this. I don't know, but you're taking a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, in certain situations when, for example, I only have them four days a month, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to just instill responsibilities in them, you know, making them do chores four days a month. It's just not going to happen. I can, I can decide of what responsibilities I can give them and then ensure that those things get done. But I think there has to be a balance between uh, reasonable and appropriate. Well, just so you know, I agree that your kids should not have to clean up a bathroom on every other weekend that they don't even use, really. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, they would use it on their weekend. But I do think that it's your prerogative. No, I'm not going to sing that. It's your <laughs> prerogative as their parent to decide if you want them to have simple chores when they are with you, like making sure that they clean up after themselves or they clean up the bathroom from toothpaste or whatever mm -hmm. before they leave to go back to their moms. Right. Yeah. I would expect them again to do what's reasonable and appropriate for that situation. Some people aren't that way though. Oh, well, I know. <laughs> and we see that a lot where the step parent thinks that when the step kids come to visit, that they should have the same amount of chores as the kids that live there full time or even the kids that live there half time. Mm -hmm. And I don't agree with that. No, I don't know. Granted, if you have your kids 50, 50, then that gives you a week for them to do things around the house, dishes, laundry, take out the trash, clean up their bedroom, whatever. But if you've only got your kids 48 hours every two weeks, I don't blame you if you don't make them do anything. I've never had to be in that situation personally, but I think that if I was in that situation where I only got to see them every other weekend, um, I mean, I would expect them to clean their room and I would expect them to clean. <laughs> I'm sorry. That came out my mouth. <laughs> Go ahead, David. I'm sorry. I apologize greatly for interrupting you I'm as you not, spoke your I'm words of not wisdom. to give you sign language right now. Um, I would expect them to clean up after themselves. For example, like you mentioned, if they brush their teeth and they leave water on the sink, that kind of stuff. But beyond that, no, I don't think, I don't think it's reasonable to expect any more than that. Right. And you know what? If they don't do it, then I'll go in there and do it. That's what you should do. And if you choose not to make them have to do anything, then you should clean up after your own kids. Yeah. And quite frankly, that's probably what it would end up happening. I would just enjoy them for the two days over here. And when they're gone, I would go in and I would clean the bathroom mess they made. And I would probably even straighten their rooms up. Would you expect your wife, the stepmother, to do that? No. I would not. It's my responsibility. Look at you, good husband of the minute. Of the minute. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I would I would want them to clean their room up, but honestly, if they didn't do it, I'd go do it. I know that. Right. I, I, I mean, what I are would. you going to do? How are you going to punish them the next time they come back in two weeks, not yeah. let them? No, I'm going to call their mom, and I'm going to say, you punish them while they're at your house. <laughs> <laughs> well, some parents actually have a co-parenting relationship where it's like that. And they can do that, but they are not. very few and far between. <laughs> you might not be listening to this podcast if that's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, you're, you know, you're off you, jumping your rainbows with your unicorns. Could you imagine my ex calling me and saying, I want you to punish? Well, first of all, she wouldn't punish them anyway, but if she would have called and said, I want you to punish your kids because they did something I didn't agree with. Well, no, she tried to get you to punish them. She would call you and tell you you needed to talk to them because they were misbehaving. She wouldn't even talk to oh, them. Oh, well, she, yeah, she would, she would call me and so and so is, um, you know, talking back to me or not doing whatever. And I can't do anything with him. I need you to talk to him. And I'm like, uh, this is your time. Learn how to parent. Now, you know, I would certainly talk to them about the expectations of being, um, shall we say, respectful. Yes, respectful to their mother. But I can't, I can't really honestly say that there wasn't a part of me inside that was going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as much as I'd hate to admit it, you know, there is that piece of this like, well, this is what you want to deal with it. Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> That's evil David, y'all. He comes out occasionally. <laughs> 
So the whole point about the chores is even if you have stepkids and bio kids and ours kids, whoever the parent is or the parents are, you get to decide what those chores are. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad idea to take the chores and say, okay, dishes need to be done every night. Vacuuming needs to be done twice a week. Whatever. Make your list and split it between the adults in the home. And the adults can either make sure it happens or they can assign those chores to their kids. That's a good idea. It is. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I do in business. I'm like, here's what needs to be done. I'm giving it to the next person under me. I don't care who does it or how it gets done. <laughs> but I'm going to hold it's that. done right. Yeah. But I'm going to hold that person responsible for it or right. accountable for it rather. Um, yeah. I think it's a, it's a great idea. The, the other aspect of chores is what to do when they don't get done. And we touched on this. So some people go down the path of, well, if the chores don't get done, then the, the parent has to do it, which I agree with. The other aspect is that people look at it and say, well, if the chores don't get done, what's the consequence? What's the punishment? And I think step parents sometimes lean into that too much. I want to know what you're going to do. I don't want to know what you're going to punish them and how are you going to punish them and punish, 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 punish. And there's two problems with that. One is that there starts to be this nagging that's happening and the step parents not going to get what they want out of that most of the time. Or if it happens, it happens in his resentment behind it. The other aspect that I think is probably a bigger problem that people don't look at is when I create a consequence for my kids, it sounds so good when I'm thinking about it. But to <laughs> implement it is a problem. Or to Be stick with it. Because, yeah, well, those go hand in hand. To implement it, stick with it. Because when I think of it and I'm like, okay, if they don't clean their room, they don't get to play video games the whole weekend. 17 weekend, minutes. <laughs> the whole weekend they're here. And I'm, you know, which sounds great until I realize that because of that, they're now writing on the walls and doing, you know, they're doing all this other crazy stuff. And, or they're just hounding me to death. Like, when am I, I want to play daily, let me play, whatever the case might be. No matter, fill in the blank of what it is, but I can't stick with the punishment because it's too severe. What I should have done is said, if they don't do X, then I'm going to take their video game playing away for an hour instead of an entire weekend, because I know that I can stick to an hour. It's better to delve out a consequence that you can stick with, that you can enforce, and it be small than to have a big one and you can't do it. Exactly right, David. Okay, we can move right along now. <laughs> All right. I do agree with that. It is easy to go in the heat of the moment. You're on restriction for 17 months. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then... Two days later, you're like, oh, my God, please go do something. Well, oftentimes, and we, we talk about this a lot in the academy, when you're coming up with these these rules and consequences, you need to do that beforehand. I know a lot of times as a parent back in the day, I didn't have a plan of what the consequence would be. I would delve out the consequence when something happened, which meant, that's when I would go to extremes because now I'm making a decision that's irrational because I'm mad <laughs> and I'm in an irrational state as it is. And so I delve out in a rational punishment and, uh, and then I can't follow through with it. And it just teaches your kids that you're, you're not a man of your word. You're not a woman of your word, whatever. And you're just going to cave. They're not worried about it. They're like, okay, yeah, I know he told us this, but you know, he's not going to stick with it. He never does. And that's and not step parents. Sorry, David, were you three? I am now. <laughs> Step parents, if your significant other punishes their kid and says they're on restriction and can't go anywhere for a day, and the next thing you know, they're letting that kid go somewhere, don't say, did you forget little Johnny was on restriction? David, say something. <laughs> <laughs> I 100% agree with that. Because the step-parents think, oh, he must have forgotten and he needs me to remind him. No, he didn't forget. Yeah. He just doesn't care about it as much as you do. Well, well, these these types of interactions between the parent and the step parent is what builds walls. It's what makes one parent 
uh, draw a line in the sand against the other one and they don't tell them things. They don't, um, they start doing things behind their back. Sometimes there's a, a me against them mentality that starts to creep in. I mean, all those things happen when, when you, when you feel like you need to be the, the step police, (laughs) 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 it just doesn't work out. It, It doesn't, I don't know that it, anybody's ever told me a time when I, when that worked out well for them. And it's not likely you'll be the first. I like that. So I'm going to use that. Stepmom does not equal policing of the stepkids. Mm-hmm. Stepdad does not equal policing of the stepkids. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All right. We hope that helps y'all with chores. And if all else fails, get a maid. Yeah. I know one thing about chores. It's oh, a chore Lord. to do. <laughs> it's Keep, a chore to do chores Well, I mean I know we're trying to get past the chore conversation But even for me I have four kids Even keeping up with what they're supposed to do Who's doing it, when they're doing it It was absolutely a chore You want to know why sometimes Parents or step parents Well, not step parents but, <laughs> but parents will just step in and go You know what, I'm just going to do it myself Because it's less of a burden Oftentimes not that's not always the case. It could be that, you know, he's got a bunch of homework tonight and I'd rather him finish his homework than get the dishes done. So I'm just going to jump in and do the dishes because they have to be done. But he also has to get this book report done that his lovely mother let him come to my house without it being done, knowing it should have been done over the weekend when she had him. Wow, that sounded like an actual thing that happened. It does. <laughs> well, something else almost sounds like an actual thing that happened. One of the kids that was supposed to do the dishes didn't and thought that, whoo, I got away with it until the next night you made them do the dishes from that night and the night before. I did, didn't I? Yes, you did. See, you do remember but, times when I did but good. <laughs> I have to say, growing up, when we were told to do the dishes, you did every dirty dish. Your kids did what would fit in the dishwasher. Yeah, and, and for you women listening, you must, when you ask someone, and this goes beyond the chore conversation, Oh, when gosh. you ask someone if they will do something for you or help you do something, you must put a time frame on the request. If you say, for example, will you gather up the trash? There must be a time given for that. Will you gather up the trash now? Will you gather up the trash within an hour? Will you gather up the trash before the morning? Give me a time frame to work with. <laughs> but when the... Woman, we will say, <laughs> is doing 20 different things, and you've asked, what can I do to help? And you say, can you bag up the trash? Is that not a given that that means now? No. Not 15 minutes after you play it on your phone. It means now. No. Why can't you just realize everything means now unless That's what we I'm state asking. otherwise? That's what I'm asking. Is if, if, if everything's now, nothing's now. <laughs> Everything's now unless I state otherwise. Everything's now unless you state otherwise. Mm-hmm. Because the problem with that is in the middle of me doing something, you'll say, can you bag the trash up? And if my thought process is, well, she means now because she didn't give me any other time. I am now very frustrated with you because I'm in the middle of doing something and your rude tail just asked me to gather the trash up. Like I ain't oh got God. nothing else going on. You know what, ladies? Eat the trash yourself, just like I did. It makes life much easier. I'm done with you, David Sims. Are you done with me now? Yeah, right now. <laughs> You're making my COVID brain hurt. All right. All right, let's get to listening to the interview. First, here's a word about the Nacho Kids Academy. David, we didn't even say anything about the interview. Okay, first, here's a word about the interview. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got COVID brain. Okay. Our guest today is Heather. She's been oh, blending. No, for... not another Heather. <laughs> She's been blending for seven years. Trigger warning, disclaimer this episode discusses suicide. Let me say that again. Disclaimer, trigger warning this episode discusses suicide. She has one deceased stepson and one stepson that's 27. No bio kids, but they are trying to conceive. The hardest part of her blend is guilty father syndrome. Why does she have to say guilty father syndrome? Why does she have to point it out, throw them under the bus? 
Who do you think she's talking about? The father. What do you want her to say? Guilty spouse syndrome? Guilty parent syndrome? It's guilty parent syndrome. Well, you know, a lot of people refer to guilty parent syndrome as Disney dad. Is that what they do? What do you do when you have a Disney mom? You rarely hear about Disney moms. Do you not? I don't know. I have maybe one. I'm in, <laughs> maybe I'm in the wrong groups. Oh, yeah, you definitely had a Disney mom. Your bio kids had a Disney mom. Correct. Okay. Best advice? Her best advice is take your time. This is not a race. Mm-hmm. Something unique about their blend? She is closer in age to the stepchildren than she is their father. <laughs> See, that's going to be me when you die. Save it. <laughs> Maybe you can get Nicole, Ethan's ex. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Now, right now, <laughs> or or the other one, the the most recent one. <laughs> that's oh, who yeah. you're going to end up with. That's exactly who I want. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, that's hilarious! I'm like, drop it to the flow. Shut <laughs> up! <laughs> and that's how I got to say because David's got my head spinning. All right, folks, let's try this again. <laughs> All right, folks, here we go. You ready? Good. Say it. <laughs> All right, folks, let's get to the interview. But first, here's a word about the Nacho Kids Academy. There is a way to save your sanity and your relationship, and it's called the Nacho Kids Academy. In the Nacho Kids Academy, you will learn the skills and knowledge to properly nacho, techniques to handle step family challenges, ways to improve your communication, and much, much more. Visit NachoKidsAcademy.com and sign up today to join other step parents who are seeing the life changing benefits of nachoing. Again, that's NachoKidsAcademy.com. Today we have stepmom Heather. Hey, Heather, how are you? Good, ma'am. How are you? Good. So tell us about your blend. How long have you been blending and how many stepkids, bio kids, all that stuff? Oh, wow. Okay. So <laughs> it's probably not as simple for me just because I have recently lost one of our stepsons or my husband lost his son last January 2021 to suicide. So there's some backstory on that. But to start from the very beginning, I have been with my husband since 2014, 15 time frame, right about that. And then we were married in 2017. When I came into their lives, they were 19 and 21. Okay. So now okay. the oldest one is 27. And the youngest one who we lost would have been 25 in September. I am so sorry to hear that. Yeah. I mean, what a waste, but he had demons. Like he had some mental health challenges that we were aware of that his mother and his father were working with him on. And, you know, sometimes it's just not enough. Well, I am glad to hear that they were trying to get him help and they recognized it because so many parents don't, and they're just caught off guard when something like that happens. Yeah. I think that it's hard to get my husband to talk about it because he just immediately loses it, like tears up and gets really upset and just doesn't want, you know, I've tried to get him therapy. He's not interested in doing that. I've considered going to therapy just so I can have a better, you know, more tools in my toolkit to help him. But mm -hmm. um, I definitely provided input throughout all of that with my youngest stepson. And some of it was heard. A lot of it went on deaf ears. I, again, uh, I, I don't know if I stated already before, but I do not have children on my own. We are trying though, but I have five siblings and I come from a broken home. I have a stepdad who I've had in my life for 18 years now. So I believe have valuable input, but you know, I find that and this, I'm sure you guys have heard it a hundred times over is that, you know, I can't speak for stepdads, but the stepmom I feel has even less of an input. And all I will say is I did my best and I have no regrets. I can tell you that his parents do not feel the same way for their actions. Right. And I'll just leave it at that. And I, and any, any parent would probably tell me, well, you don't know because it wasn't your son. Well, I was in his life during some formidable years and spent a lot of time with him and had a bond with him that I unfortunately will probably never have with my oldest stepson, um, no matter how hard I try. So I will say I saw the signs. I consulted with friends of mine, peers, and when it happened, I was flabbergasted and I was upset and heartbroken. 
but I can't sit here and tell you that I didn't know it was going to happen. I knew he was going to do it. So I, I did my best as the stepmother to provide as much input, parenting, counsel, love and support. I think some of it resonated with my stepson, but it just wasn't enough. And I do not blame myself. I don't blame his mother. I don't blame his father. But it is hard being on the outside looking in, being like, this is not how I would handle it. This is not what he needs. Like, this is what he needs. But different strokes for different folks. Like, I wasn't his mom. So uh, frankly, I don't think that anyone really cared about what I thought or how I felt or my, my counsel because he wasn't my son. Right. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, because had he had been, things would be different. I'll, I'll just say that. Like, I, I know how I'm going to parent when we have our own. And again, I was raised differently and comes from a broken home as well and had a couple stepdads in his life. And our, our, our family situations are different, but people just do things differently. And, you know, I, I'm not here to bag on them as parents. Like, what happened was horrible. And, you know, I, I guess he just wasn't meant to be here any longer than the time that he was destined to be here. Yeah. And I'm glad that you don't have any regrets. Not one. And I hate that his parents do. But, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about the people I know that have had kids that have committed suicide. And there have been ones that did everything possible and it still didn't stop it but they still have those regrets because they couldn't control it. Yeah. And that could have been the case. That's all, you know, like hindsight 2020 could have, should have, would have, Yeah. you know, maybe if they would have tried my approach, he still would have done it anyways. But, you know, you don't ever know. I unfortunately had a front row seat to it. And there were so many times, like I would be screaming in my mind, like, this is not the way, this is not how this should be done. You know, he needed intrusive parenting. So I'm prior and current military as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, My husband is, I'm I'm an active reservist, um, but I, you know, I have a civilian job as well, full time. But everyone always asks me, well, did you meet your husband in the service? They just assumed that he was in. And no, I did not. He is a civilian, but uh, just the way he parents and the way that I parent, is just really different. And I'm not saying his way is bad and I'm not saying my way is better, but I just, you know, there were times it was please let's go a different route. But I would bring it up and I would get screamed at or dismissed. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, with the whole nacho kids, unfortunately, even in situations like that, you can't force anyone to do it your way. Sometimes you have to step back. Yeah. And, uh, that would probably be a good yeah. junction point for us to move on to the next thing if you wanted to. Yeah. Was there something that triggered it? You know, even though you knew it was coming, Because a lot of times people think, well, what caused it? We knew they were, for lack of a better word, unstable. But little Johnny breaking up with his girlfriend is what the trigger was. He was on and off medication. And the excuses were always, I don't like the way I feel. You know, I don't like this. I don't like that. And it's like, okay, well, you know, my thing was, if you don't like it, let's just try the next one and the next one and the next one. But if no one is monitoring that, you don't know if he's on it or not. Again, going back to intrusive parenting, which I firmly believe in, if you're having, you know, particularly this type of a challenge, like you should just be on top of your kid. And he was in and out of school. So that was difficult to do. But again, like coulda, shoulda, woulda. Um, I don't blame either one of them for for how they handled it. There's nothing we can do about it now. It's, it's you know, it's since passed. But so he had been in and out of school. Mm-hmm. He had bounced back and forth. His father's alumni from there. So there was a great deal of pride with him going there. And he was also in like a semi-military program as well. So I was super proud of him for that because I thought that that type of structure would be really good for him. And he was about a year and a half behind, but he was on his senior year and his grades started to get better. And I was happy for that. Like I said, okay, well, if he's going to make good grades, like let's start taking him on some vacations with us. Cause typically we travel alone we're adults and his other son has a family and they're adults and we kind of do our own thing, you know, both on second marriages and his kids are grown. So we do our own vacations. And, you know, with this one, with the youngest one, I'd said, well, he's doing so good. Like let's take him on a couple vacations with us. Cause we usually go all out. Mm-hmm. So we went on some vacations together. He did pretty well on those, went back to school. And in September of, you know, the couple months before January, before it happened, 
he had another meltdown. I call it meltdowns where he wasn't going to class. He was going down the street to this little like mini mart and getting alcohol and just kind of hanging out in his room and drinking by himself. And uh, I can't remember how we found out about it. if it was through his mom or if his dad was like, hey, I saw some charges like from this little mini mart. What are you doing? Mm-hmm. And he admitted what he was doing. And, you know, I had gotten on the phone with him and gave my heart to heart and was like, listen, you're not dropping out of school. You know, you've come this far. You need to graduate. Talked to him about like what his options were. And there weren't a whole lot. It was kind of like you can drop out and go work at a fast food restaurant because you have no connections to anywhere for an internship for a non-college grad you know, because that's what's going to end up happening. Mm-hmm. Or you can get out now, which what a waste that would be. You know, you have just a couple credit hours left. You know, you can join the military. I'll help you get with a recruiter. Or you can finish and, you know, start off making $60,000 a year at your new job, like with your paramilitary organization. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I, I know I need to grow up and I know I need to, you know, I'll stop. I'll, you know, I'll be good again. And I'll, you know, that's also my husband sent him up with a, with a counselor, like a telezoom, because it was a, uh, COVID time. So, and also it just was easier for, I guess, for him to do the zoom. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So that all like got on the up and up again, Christmas came. He was surprisingly normal. And I'll tell you what normal is, was normal for him. He was bathed regularly. He was clean when he came over. He was dressed nice, like in new clothes that, you know, his parents always buy him clothes, but he never wears them, always wears the same thing, even if it's dirty. Mm -hmm. So he had new clothes on. He had been, he was clean and he was being normal. Now back up a little bit and you're like, well, why, why is that normal? Well, we think, and I don't have access to his medical records and his parents didn't either, either because they didn't make him sign off on the HIPAA, but we think he had schizophrenia. So there were plenty of times where he was super manic, not clean wearing the same dirty clothes. Uh, It seemed like wearing the same clothes, like a comfort thing for him, but he was schizophrenic, we think. Mm -hmm. So I kind of got a sinking feeling in my gut in December, this isn't right. He's trying to be the kid that we want him to be. This isn't normal behavior. And also too, with the military, we get a lot of suicide prevention training. Mm -hmm. And typically when there's a radical change in behavior, that's not a good thing. Right, that's a sign. So it's a sign. And it's like, I wanted my husband to enjoy Christmas with his son, you know, with the family and stuff. And there wasn't going to be a point for me to say, oh, my God, husband, I think he's going to do this. Like my husband would have just brushed it off 100 percent been like, let's just enjoy the holiday. Like he's fine. Mm -hmm. So I didn't say anything. I still don't have any regrets because I know if I would have said anything, it just would have sparked a fight. Right. And and I'll get into that later because I have a lot of good information, I think, for your listeners regarding my second stepson. Okay. So January came. And again, he had gotten good grades for that fall semester despite his little week long sabbatical. And I said, let's take him to Montana with us to go skiing. He came to Montana with us. That went really well. It was his first time skiing. My husband took on that sport late on in life with me. So kids have never shown a desire. Well, he came with us. That wrote really well. It was a lot of fun. Like I remember it because it was just January 2021, 20, very vividly. Mm-hmm. And three weeks later, my husband came home and he was on the phone with his ex wife and she was having a meltdown and she's very emotionally charged, very dramatic. So for me to hear him on the phone with her bawling and screaming and acting like how she does, it was not like a, it wasn't, it didn't alert me at all. It was just kind of like, has she been drinking again? Why is she calling you at eight o'clock at night? Mm -hmm. And he had just flown back from Lubbock. But I was like, you know, relax. It's probably he's on a bender again. He probably, instead of like calling and admitting like he's been screwing up, he probably just like went off with his friends or something. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Well, the next day came and they had a search party out with all the students and they had the police force looking for him. It was a big deal. They had helicopters and everything. And, um, didn't find him that night and the whole time. And again, I don't regret this. I didn't know. I didn't have a feeling mm-hmm. or maybe I was just ignoring my instincts, but I was like, just relax. He, he's done. And my husband's argument was he's never just disappeared. And I said, I know he's never just disappeared, but some of the antics he's pulled have been pretty like catastrophic, packing up his stuff, leaving from school, walking off a full-time job, not coming back. Like, Mm-hmm. for no reason other than I just didn't like it, not consulting with anybody ahead of time. Like he's done some pretty outrageous behaviors, you know, when we all think it's going well. So then the following morning was a Friday. 
And my husband's like, I'm going to go to and like work with the police department. And I said, okay, honey, that's fine. Let me go into work and just like get like let my boss know. And I was like, and then I'll get on the road. <sighs> I will never forget. I, cause I worked at a warehouse at the time I uh, had my vest on. It's like a, like a safe, safety vest and jeans and boots and a t-shirt and had a cup of coffee in my hand. And I'm walking out with my keys in my hand to go to work. And my husband calls me and he's wailing and telling me that his son's dead. And they deployed drones and they found something that looked like it was suspicious and sent up cadaver dogs. And they found my stepson hanging from a tree. Oh, gosh. So, you know, and when somebody hangs himself, you know, that wasn't like a cry for help. He went out into the middle of nowhere because I went out and saw the tree that he did it from. Like you had to have a gator to get up there because there was quicksand and mud. Like I don't even know how he got up there Mm -hmm. to where he did, but it was a couple miles behind his school. And yeah, I mean, he absolutely had a mission in mind and, uh, you know, he wanted to do it and he wanted to be by himself and he wanted to make sure it got done. And that's, that's the sad part about it all is that just such a waste of a life a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Right. But obviously not in his mind. He was obviously so troubled and so distraught. And we also found in his personal belongings, some diaries he had written and some of the stuff he wrote. I think some of them were draft suicide notes, to be honest with you, but some of the stuff he wrote, that person, my son was not in his right mind. He was out of his mind. Yeah. And you know, it is what it is. That that's where we're at with that. So you refer to him as your son. I mean, he was my son. Like, I don't care if I just had him for five years. He was my son. So. Yeah. And you loved him tremendously. You can tell. Yeah. I mean, it just, I knew he was like a troubled soul and he was kind of a little weirdo too. And I have always been a fan of the underdog because I, in my life have been at that at times. And I know how hard it is, how hard life can seem like it is. And, you know, I have mental health challenges, like in my immediate family, my dad suffered from it. So I get how that type of mind works and it's like a broken record and it seems like it's never going to get better. And obviously his was on a whole different chemical level. Schizophrenia is very predominant in males. They typically don't last past the age of 23. They usually just Mm self-destruct. There's no cure for it. It can only be controlled by medication and intensive support from families. And it just, I I thought I was going to have longer with him. I knew he was going to do what he was going to do, but I figured he would do it later on in life. And then also you'd ask me, what was the trigger? I think the actual trigger was is that he was about to graduate and all of those times he yanked himself out of school or had all the excuses he had for not wanting to go back and stay at his mother's for six months and do nothing but work at this little sub shop down the street he was delaying the inevitable like he knew he was going to have to launch from the nest and i think that that must have scared the crap out of him to an extent i mean he did really well in school and when he had a job he always did really well with it very responsible hyper focused And also, too, I should mention that he was in high school, late high school, diagnosed as autistic on spectrum, Mm -hmm. possible Asperger's. So I don't know if that's helpful to anybody out there, but you could tell there wasn't something right with him. But, you know, he was just a weird kid, and I didn't judge him for that. I just tried to work with him, and he was also very much my my husband's son. Like, he was his father's son. And uh, loved spending time with him. That was his baby. So I did my best to cultivate that. Like we had not gone on just trips recently, but he had been on a lot of camping trips with us in his time outside of school when he wasn't actively attending school in person. He spent a lot of time at our house too, like overnights and stuff like that. So who did he live with for the most part? Was he living with dad and in between mom and dad when this happened? No. Well, I got to give her credit. She had the primary custody of him. And the deal kind of was, is that, well, number one, we live in a really small house. Like I have a two bedroom, one bath. It's like a historic home. So like, it's just really small. And then also we were paying for everything from like a financial standpoint, like his school and his insurance and everything that you could possibly think of, we were footing the bill for. So the agreement was between his mom and his dad, that he would 
live with his mother when he was off of school, like permanently. He could still come over here and spend a couple nights the weekend, but like his mom had primary custody. His little job was down where he he lived at because they live an hour and a half away. And then we just saw him for visits. Okay. So between the two stepkids, you had the best relationship with him. Yeah, I would say I pretty much don't have a relationship with my oldest stepson. Why do you think that is? His mother. I can't take all the credit away from him. He's a 27-year-old man with two children and a wife, so he knows better. Mm -hmm. But yeah, his mom has poisoned the well since day one with him, you know, with my daughter-in-law. And it's just, that's how it is. And because my husband, guilty father syndrome, you know, allows it, that just kind of puts me in that bucket. Yeah. Why do you think that she wasn't able to have that negative influence on your younger stepson? Because he, the younger stepson, I think was very aware that his mom was just kind of be really frank, kind of full of it Mm -hmm. and could see both sides of the story. They didn't have a good marriage for a really long time. I met him after they got divorced. So I didn't have anything to do with that. Right. And he wanted to see both of his parents happy, just not his mom. She had a boyfriend or she's had a boyfriend since as long as I've been with my husband. She's not married. They've not gotten married, but she's got a job and and a boyfriend that lives with her and grandkids. And I think the youngest one kind of saw everything holistically. First damaged as he was, could see, well, dad's happy now. Mm -hmm. Leave dad alone. Dad should be able to get be happy. Dad deserves happiness. Yeah. So you had mentioned that you had some information to share about your relationship with your older stepson. Yeah. So I did what every stepmom does, overcompensate, try. And I still didn't go to the extreme that I could have, but I kind of knew from the beginning not to invest too much, but invest as much as I was comfortable with. I would buy the grandkids gifts. You know, whenever they came over, they had gifts, did all the holiday shopping. The couple of times that we had them over for dinner, I organized, you know, all the, you know, the meals and stuff like that. And I really wasn't getting any type of response from them at all. I would ask him a question and then my, you know, this would be right in front of my husband. You would think that he would do something, but, you know, guilty father syndrome, rose colored lenses, you know, I'd ask him a question and he or her, you know, the daughter in law would be really slow to respond or ignore me to where I'd have to like repeat myself, you know, just really passive aggressive, immature behavior. And I don't know if you can kind of tell in the short time we've talked, I have a zero tolerance for crap, Mm -hmm. disrespect, BS. Like I have a wonderful life despite our challenges and I'm grateful for everything I have. But at the same time, I do not tolerate anything from anyone work-related, military or at home. So I feel I gave them plenty of chances. Talked to my husband to ad nauseum about it. Gave him examples like this happened. And this is how it made me feel. Mm-hmm. And it's, this is not acceptable. Like, would you let somebody treat you like that? He would just kind of look at me and nod his head and say, well, no, and that's not right. And I'll talk to him. He never talked to him. I know that he didn't. He was hesitant to do it before the youngest one died. Now that the youngest one is gone, he'll never say anything because he's scared to death to lose his oldest, his oldest son. I can understand that. Yeah, I can understand it too. Yeah, I get it. And that's a hard pill to swallow, stepmoms. It really is. Mm -hmm. When you know that you have influence over your husband for everything but his children. I know it's hard. I get it. So, you know, did the whole, like, try to be a good stepmom thing. And then at one point got tired of it and was like, I read a bunch of disengagement essays and forums on stepmom support sites and decided I was going to do that. Well, that happened right around, it was like December before the youngest one did what he did because they had come over and I had bought all these gifts and they didn't really, they like said, thank you to my husband, but not to me. It's like, well, I'm the one who went and bought all this for the last four months. And I set this up and kind of got, you know, it's not that I needed credit, but like a thank you would have been nice. And yeah, it just, nothing ever directed at me. And I, you know, they come in, they hug him and don't come near me. That's hurtful. They treat me like I have leprosy or something. It just, it's, it's really disgusting behavior on their part. So I decided after Christmas, I was going to disengage. Well, then Brant, you know, he, my son, youngest son did what he did. And I was like, well, I'll wait a couple months. Well, their behavior got even worse and was like, it's a shame I have to do this around this time, but I got to worry about, you know, my mental health as well. So I would say I've been disengaging since April of last year. And it's hard, particularly if your natural tendencies are to be kind and loving and generous and inclusive, you know, it's hard when they come over here. And I don't say anything. And then they don't say anything. 
-hmm. And I will definitely say that everyone is very uncomfortable now. And I've tried to explain to my husband, I was like, well, do you notice that the only person who changed their behavior was me? I was like, why is it my job to make sure everybody's comfortable? They're your, it's your son and your daughter-in-law. If you don't like the tone or the feeling, you need to speak to your son about that because I'm done. I was like, never in my life if I had people treat me the way that, you know, your son and your daughter-in-law do, and I'm not going to tolerate it. I'm, I'm not surely not going to ban them from my home because that would be my fault, but I don't have to engage when they come over here. I will watch TV. I'll come out, sit down for a while and kind of watch everything, wait for someone to say something to me. They just pretend like I'm not here. They did that at Christmas too. That was really hurtful. I know my husband was really upset about it, but his whole thing is guilty father syndrome is it's all on me. I mm-hmm. should be making the effort. Well, yeah. Sorry. You know, <laughs> you know, tough luck, Chuck, I'm closer to age to them than I am to my husband. If they were minors, 10, 9, 13, 14, it would be different, but they are adults with children. Mm -hmm. And so I just have put it on my husband. I said, when you want things to get better and you talk to them or talk to your son, you really don't need to talk to your daughter. When you talk to your son, you let me know. But until then, like I, I don't prevent him from seeing them, but I don't go to stuff anymore. Um, not that we were really ever invited to anything because his mother always has the ex bio mom has dibs on all that. So we get left out on a lot of invites, like baby showers, wedding showers, christenings. We miss like both christenings, the kids we weren't invited to. And I've tried to tell my husband, like, that's pretty screwed up. Are you going to say something? He's like, oh, I will. But I know that he doesn't. So I'm really of the mindset of you get, there's a saying for it. You receive what you allow. And he allows really just low level behavior, disrespect. and. They're nice enough, but I think that my husband could get a lot more from his oldest son if he had like a really serious but short conversation with him. It's like, hey, I've been with this person for this amount of time and I love her a lot. And, you know, you don't have to like her, but you're going to have to be nicer when you come over. You need to like make an effort. And so that this isn't awkward because you guys are making it awkward. Like she's tried for six years and gotten nothing from you and she's done. So Mm-hmm. but I know he's never going to have that conversation with him. So I just don't think about it. And to all the stepmoms out there, I really, really encourage you to, to read up on disengagement because I've read on a lot of forums that you all did what I did, but you did it for 15 or you did it for 20 years. Mm-hmm. I only did it intermittently for six. So I feel like I got off on easy street, but your marriage should take precedence over the kids. Bottom line, the marriage needs to be put on a pedestal. And mm-hmm. I wish things were better. I do. I don't like disengaging. It's very unnatural for me. I've had non-step, all my, none of my friends are step parents, but I've had my friends tell me, oh, well, that's just going to add fuel to the fire. And that's not good. And your husband needs to do this, or you need to do this. No, this is working for us right now. The weight's taken off my back and I don't have to worry about it anymore. I don't feel guilty about it anymore. And, you know, I'm living my best life. And I really think the person who feels probably the most guilty is my husband because he deep down knows that this is his fault Mm -hmm. until he's willing to step up and have those crucial conversations. Status quo is going to remain the same. And I have a wonderful marriage despite just losing a stepson, despite going through infertility issues. We just had a failed IVF cycle. We're about to try again in a couple months, but we have a lovely home. We have great jobs. We have friends that love us. We have family that love us. You know, we have pets we love. I mean, we travel a lot for shame. For these women out there that let these stepkids destroy their marriages. This sounds really harsh, but I know, and I, uh, let me back up a little bit. I'm, I could be wrong, but I get the distinct feeling that my oldest stepson, he doesn't care whether I'm alive or dead. Yep. And I've tried to tell my husband, I was like, do you know how that feels to have someone that close to me? Because he's close to you. So he's inherently close to me. To have to be around somebody like that or interact them, mm-hmm. have to spend Christmas with them. I was like, it's 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 a horrible feeling. You know, right. my husband just gives me this blank stare. It's like, oh, well, that's not true. I was like, you know, it's like talking to a wall. And, and I've tried to tell my husband also, like, he doesn't care if you're happy or not. Like, he's a wounded, spoiled little boy, a 27-year-old brat, really, that doesn't care whether or not you're happy. Because if he cared about you being happy, he would be welcoming towards me or at least polite. Right. You know, <laughs> at least decent. I never expected them to call me mom or anything, but for Christ's sakes, I really thought I would get baseline respect like, hello, how are you? How's your job? 
how's the dog, you know, how was your duty, you know, military duty. And, and that, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. Mm-hmm. And a lot of stepmoms out there expected very baseline and um, didn't get it. And they let it erode at their marriage. And I'm telling you, ladies, it's not worth it because, you know, eventually you have to hope that your husband will, will wake up. But if he doesn't, you just do you, you know? Yeah. And I know that's harder said than done, particularly for stepmoms with younger children that are completely in it, you know, with the handoff and the drop offs and all that. Like I get it, but it's not going to be like that forever. Ladies like you, it'll get better, but you have to do the disengagement and it is hard in the beginning. Yeah. It's definitely not easy. And it's so frustrating when, and I'm not just saying that your husband's like this, but they're all like, that. <laughs> <laughs> but when all the pressure is put on the stepmom to build that relationship with the stepkid. Well, if the stepkid can't acknowledge when the stepmom says hello, what are she supposed to do? Or when the, she gives them a gift and they don't say thank you or they're not appreciative, what is she supposed to do? If it hurts her feelings, continue to do it? No. I have had longer comp, like I have, like we have neighbors across the street we're pretty close with. I've talked to one of my neighbors more in one day than me and my stepson had have had conversation in six years. Yeah. How sad is that? It's very sad. It is very sad. And I mean, has he told his dad, I just don't like her or I mean, anything? He just completely Um, ignores you? I'll give you a little example. I don't know what conversations they have. I don't get that they're very deep. My husband struggles with communication, Mm -hmm. even with me. I'm overly communicated. He under communicates and practices avoidance. I don't like confrontation, but I will do it if I have to. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way that is. No one should like it, but if you need to do it, you should do it because that's part of being an adult. Right. But when Christmas came and they came over and I reciprocated when they gave. So when my daughter-in-law walked through the door, she said, Merry Christmas. And I turned around very cheerfully and said, well, Merry Christmas to you too. Mm -hmm. And then there were no words to me the rest of the time they were here. And we had some friends over too. And that was by design. So I wouldn't be all by myself. So it was kind of like weird, but it worked. My husband kind of entertained them and I entertained the friends. And then we kind of all talked to each other at one point, but there was definitely like some awkwardness, but the awkwardness isn't because of me. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess it's blamed on me because I'm not trying anymore. You know, I'm not putting forth the effort, but they're not doing anything differently than they were before, which was zero, literally zero effort. So Right. So why does it fall on you? Exactly. I guess he does. He thinks it should fall on me because I'm an adult. Well, they are too. He is too. I 100% agree with you, Lori. Yeah. But my husband and I got into it a little bit. Everyone stayed over very late that night and um, there was some alcohol involved. Not anything crazy, but you know, it was Christmas day. Everyone was drinking and we were having a good time. And later on, and I think he was a little inebriated when he said it, because it was like two o'clock in the morning. He had said to me, it may not even been that night. It may have been the next day. He was like, I was talking to stepson number one outside. And he said, well, go ahead and tell, you know, he's like, I don't know why everything's so weird, something along those lines. And, you know, tell Heather, I said, Merry Christmas. And I whipped around on my husband and said, at that point, you should have said, why don't you go in the house and tell her Merry Christmas? Yeah. But you didn't. You just sat there and said, oh, I know, I know. I'll talk to her. Like, I'm sure you always do, but I don't really know because you don't tell me. Then he just, you know, gives me that stupid blank stare. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, he, I I really, really deep down think think that it's a, it's a loyalty bind to his mother and the daughter-in-law has been around the mother like a million times over. So that well is poisoned. But I will say, I do not think that my stepson is a bad person. I think he's a brat. And I think that he's spoiled rotten because we paid for, and I'll say we, because we are married and I'm a 50-50 joint holder on everything. I bring in 50% of the income. We couldn't have the house. We couldn't have the life that we have if it weren't for me. And we couldn't have the life that we have if it weren't for him. Like, Mm -hmm. so, and I'm not saying that my mom was a stay-at-home mom for 16 years. I would not be where I'm at today had my mom not stayed home. But from just a little bit different perspective. I'm a equal stakeholder to all financials and everything in this home. So with all that being said, I think that my stepson wants to like me, but because of the loyalty bind to his mother, 
that's just always going to, to reign number one. I'm not going to say though, it wouldn't benefit him because I think he wants to be parented. Like I think every kid wants to be parented even when they're adults. I don't think it would hurt them at all if my husband pulled him aside and had a conversation, but I, I think things would get better and my husband would just have to constantly reinforce it. But my husband's so scared of losing him. He will never have that conversation with him. Yeah. Oh, and going back to like when I said my stepson was a brat, I guess it's kind of harsh. Uh, I just, <laughs> we, we put him through private school, a very expensive private school education. He played football. There were expenses associated with that. We pay for student loan payments each month. I'm not real happy about that, but that's a whole nother story. You know, that's kind of like, we can afford it. We're doing it, but it's like, well, he's 27. Why isn't he paying off his own student loans? Mm -hmm. So that's a whole nother conversation. But again, ladies, you just have to pick and choose your battles. And if my story at all resonates with you, like, I really think you need to look into disengagement. Yes, definitely. So you said you've been disengaging since about when? April of last year. Okay. Did you see positive changes with the blend or any changes with the blend or just within yourself and how you felt better? I don't think that we see them enough for there to be a positive change with the blend left. I think that they know the tides have changed. And I think it's kind of like they don't know what to do now because I'm not trying and I think they're also going to use that as an excuse to show up here even less, which I'm fine with. Um, mm -hmm. They live 45 minutes away. My husband has a vehicle. He can go to their house and see him every weekend if he wants to. Yeah. You know, I'm never going to stop that. And I don't ever complain about it when he spends time with them. That's another thing, ladies. Don't keep your husband from his kids. Yes. Do not keep your husband from your, their kids. Do not ban them from the home if you can help it. Let that relationship cultivate on its own, even if you're not included. And I know that's very hard. Yeah. And allow them to have that alone time with their kids. Even if you're around, it's okay for them to go somewhere with their kid or for them to have conversations without you present. Yep. That's all okay. Mm -hmm. But I would say what I saw the most out of this engagement thus far is a change within myself. I stopped feeling bad and like stopped having my feelings hurt because if you're not putting anything out there, you know, you can't really get hurt. Right. Right. I mean, there's a little bit of a little pang in my heart when, cause like I'm a giver. So anytime I would see stuff for the grandkids, like I'd pick it up and I still see stuff. And I, I can't tell you Lori, how many times I've picked up stuff and put it in my cart. And then I put it back mm -hmm. because why would you continue to reward bad behavior? And, um, also I was really invested with the firstborn grandchild. And then, you know, after everything that happened, I kind of, cause the second grandchild kind of came around that he was born in July. And I've not even held him. And that's not because I didn't don't want to hold him or don't want to spend time with him. The daughter-in-law just, when she comes over, really doesn't offer for anyone to hold him. But mm -hmm. with the first one, I had begged my husband numerous times, like, why don't you ever take pictures of me with the grandbaby? Like, I've asked you a hundred times to do it and you never do it when they come over. And he still didn't do it. And then when the second grandbaby came, you know, I that's was full blown and you know, started with my disengagement. It's like, well... I don't want this to be a repeat. So I'm going to have to distance myself a little bit. And it's not like she offered for me to hold the baby. And I said, no, but like I, instead of asking, I waited and I got nothing. Right. And I'm not going to force a relationship on anybody. And then also too, by me disengaging, I want to have a relationship with my step grandkids, but it will only be a matter of time, unfortunately, that their parents' behavior will influence theirs. And I don't want to get emotionally invested in step grandkids that are going to quite possibly act like their parents. So, which is understandable. Yeah, that I'm glad, you know, and that's probably really hard for some people to hear because it's like, oh, you know, you shouldn't blame the kids and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. Well, I'm not blaming the grandkids. It's a reality. They're little now, but they're eventually going to pick up if this doesn't get resolved. They're going to pick up on their parents' behavior mm -hmm. and act accordingly because monkey see, monkey do. That's just what little kids do. Right. And it's not like, you would feel comfortable calling and saying, hey, can the grandkids come spend the weekend with us? Because you don't have that relationship with the bio parent. Oh, yeah. I've even talked to my husband about that. I was like, you probably don't ever ask to have the kids over because you know she would say no. They would say no. And he just kind of looked at me and was like, well, yeah, you're probably right. And it's like, well, I don't want to be right. Like, I want you to do something about it. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying this to make you feel bad. 
you know, I want you to do something about it. But at the end of the day, all those years I spun my wheels, he's got to want it more than I do. Yes. You know, it's his son, it's his grandkids. Like if I want it more than he does, like how backwards is that? Right. Exactly. And that can even apply to when the bio parent doesn't want their bio kid as much as the step parent does. A lot of times we see the stepmoms push the bio dad to get custody or more visitation, whatever, with the step kid. And then they bite themselves in the butt later, wishing they'd never done it. Yeah, I've read a lot of stories about that. Mm -hmm. Now, you say that you grew up in a blend. Yes. How old were you when your parents split up? I believe I was, their divorce took six years. It was really nasty. Oh, but gosh. Yeah. And uh, it started, though, I think I was 14. 14 is 14 or 15. So by the time the divorce was final. I was 19. Were you still living at home? No, I was in college. So during the time that they were going through the divorce, how often did, I'm assuming you stayed with your mom. How often did you see your dad? Every other weekend. And then at one point I fell for the, Hey, if you come live with me, I'll buy you a car and you know, I won't ride you like your mother and all this other stuff. So I went and went lived with him for like a year. And then that blew up because that wasn't a ploy. It, it was just basically a trick. So he wouldn't have to pay my mom child support. And mm -hmm. he did not care for me while I was there. Like I'd have to call my mom and be like, dad, like didn't, there's no food in the house. I have no dinner. So um, a year later, I ended up pretty much eating crow and coming back to my mom and being like, I want to live with you. Or, you know, it was right before I graduated high school, probably about six months before then mm -hmm. I'd, I'd gone back and lived with my mom and said, I'll, I'll, I'll come, I'll be good. Like, can I come back? I'll be good. And dad lied about everything and it's not working out. And can I come back? Yeah. And I'm sure she's welcomed you with open arms. Yes. I don't think my stepdad so much. I think he had his reservations because I was a pistol, but there goes, there's a little bit of background with that. I mean, you know, there was some infidelity and it wasn't that I was mad that my mom cheated. It was the aftermath of it. My dad was a borderline narcissistic personality disorder type person. So when he found out that she was leaving after 16 years and did everything he could to blow up her life, mm -hmm. because it's like, if I can't have you, even though I treat you like crap and don't really care for you, if I can't have you, nobody will. And mm -hmm. same thing with my kids. So really nasty, ugly divorce. My regrets with my mom was like, well, I just wish you would have waited till you were divorced to reveal like your other suitor that you soon married after. But other than that, my biggest issue with my stepdad was, is that he no longer does. But at the time, I believe he had an alcohol problem. And it was kind of like, well, I don't really like the way that he treats you. Mm -hmm. I mean, not saying it was okay when dad treated you like crap, but he was at least my dad. And then right. you left my dad and then you married some other guy. That's also treating you like crap. That's also treating you like crap. So of course, I'm not going to like him. Like I tell my mom, like, how would you like if someone treated Nana bad, her mother who's still alive? And she's like, I would lose my mind. I said, that's the way that I feel. I was like, so I cannot stand when he is nasty to you. And mm -hmm. I'm not going to tolerate it. I didn't tolerate it with my real dad. Why do you think I'm going to tolerate it with my stepdad? Yeah. But 17 years later, we've mostly gotten over all that. He had to stop drinking because of a medical issue. And he's still a jerk. So I guess it was never <laughs> the alcohol. That's just the way that he is. Mm -hmm. But I will say, I take away from my parent, my mom's second marriage. You kind of got to, even if it's not good for her, if she thinks it's good for her, you need to be supportive of it you know, and, uh, to an extent, I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't like the way they treated her, but there was no physical abuse involved. It was just mostly verbal. And I, I guess maybe that's just how they roll. I don't know, but, you know, be supportive. If she's happy, then you need to be happy for her. That's just how it is. And then also a really big takeaway I took from my mom and my stepdad is that my stepdad had three kids of his own. I love my step siblings very much. Um, there's six of us total. And only one time did my youngest stepbrother try to get over on my mom. Mm -hmm. And I thought my stepdad was going to kill him. Whipped around in him so quick, had him up against a wall. Uh, not like didn't put hands on him, but like pushed him with right. his chest right. against the wall and was like, you're not going to talk to my wife like that. And that is the only time ever that in his kids are very lovely. Again, love them very much. My step siblings are awesome. But when the little one tried, it was just that one time that it never happened again. And also too, one of the reasons why my mom was so willing to let me go live with my dad was that I was not Granted, I thought he deserved it, but I was a kid. I guess it wasn't my place. I was a pistol to my stepdad and my mom didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And she has never been tolerant of us treating him badly. And we're not really those type of kids anyways, but 
you know, even like side jokes or comments, like she gets really upset about it and like corrects us and we don't do it anymore, but we did a lot when we were younger. Mm -hmm. It's just something that they had really good going for them is that they did not allow their bio kids to disrespect the step parent. Right. And what about your dad? Did he ever get remarried? He did not. And he died suddenly from a heart attack when I was 31. I was texting him and he wasn't responding, but that was kind of typical of my dad. He kind of texts back when he wanted to, and he wasn't really good with the phone. And then they found him three days later, dead in his condo. So he died just from some random heart attack. And yeah, so, but he never did get remarried. Um, I found out after he died though, that he had had a lot of women um, that he would see like visitors, mm-hmm. not prostitutes, uh, I don't think, but right, just friends had, with benefits. Had, had friends with benefits. And when I talked to his best friend about it, I was like, oh my God, Jack, I'm like, dad was really doing that. And he's like, yeah, all the time. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, well, why didn't I know? He's like, he would have never wanted you to know that about him. It wouldn't have been respectful towards you as his daughter. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm glad at least my dad was somewhat happy before he passed away. So, yeah, but no, yeah. he never got remarried and he would have never got remarried because all he ever did was focus on everything my mother took from him when she left, which was, you know, it's the state of Florida. Like she got half his retirement and stuff like that. But my dad was a nuclear engineer. Like he was able to recoup that money relatively quickly, mm-hmm. like not like a decade, probably four or five years. So, I mean, that he was always obsessed with recouping what my mom took from him, not entitled to, but took from him. And, you know, his world centered around money a lot. So, so even though she committed adultery, they didn't hold that against her? No, they did not because she was able to prove abuse. Oh, okay. Like she had pictures, like there was physical a mental, emotional, and then there also was some physical abuse with us kids. Okay. So it was a pretty bad situation. So they did not hold it against her. Yeah, I know a lot of states do and some don't. It just depends. I think that if my mom could do it all over again, she probably would have stayed with my dad and attempted to get him therapy. You think so? Yeah. So that goes to show you it's not that she didn't love him. She just, Lori, she just got tired of it. You know, 16 years of being verbally, mentally abused and you know, treated like crap and then on and off with the kids. I mean, I'm the oldest and I had a young, I have a younger brother and a younger sister and my brother and I got it pretty bad and, you know, corporal punishment, all that type of stuff. And but despite all of that, I was afforded private school. I never went hungry. I closed mm-hmm. on my back. I had a nice house to live in. And that's something that kind of kills me with my stepson is that he doesn't have any clue on how bad life can be. So for Mm -hmm. shame that he treats his father the way that he does, because my husband is a saint compared to my dad and my dad, although for all his faults, he was still my father and I love, I still love him. And I Mm -hmm. wish I could have had a chance to say goodbye. And I missed out on that opportunity. But it sounds like y'all had a decent relationship when he did pass. We did. um, There was a stint where we didn't speak for five years and then we reconciled and Things were on the up and up after that. But there were times I had to distance myself from him because he was very toxic. Well, thank God it wasn't during that five years that he passed. No, but, you know, you always have regrets when you have a sudden death like that. I I wish I would have done more. I wish I would have been the bigger person more, but I defaulted a lot to, well, you're the old guy. You're my dad. Like, you're supposed to know better. What I'm like, you know. Now, you said that your husband also comes from a broken home. Yes. Was his experience similar to yours? He talks very highly of his mother. I unfortunately didn't get to meet her. She died from early onset Alzheimer's in her 60s. Oh. So long before I came along. But uh, yeah, she was with his father, who I met and spent time with before he died from a stroke. And the father was committed infidelity a couple times. And she was very much a self-made woman, had a job, was a teacher at a local fashion college. So she, I just think after once or twice was like, I'm done with you. Mm -hmm. And then he went on to remarry two or three times. I think the third wife was the last one that he had. And I had met her and she was very sweet. They'd been together for like 25, 30 years, but they both passed in the past four years. And then the, the mom, his mother did remarry. And believe it or not, I thought that at our wedding, his step, he invited his stepfather because my husband handled his own family's invites. Mm-hmm. And it was after the wedding. I was like, oh, well, you know, I didn't see your stepdad or I didn't get to meet him. He's like, he wasn't invited. I was like, why did you not invite your stepdad? He's like, I don't know. I don't have a relationship with him. 
And I was like, well, your brother talks to him all the time. I was like, that's terrible. And he was like, well, I just don't have a relationship with him. And that was just kind of like, I think that that might have like a connection to my stepson, the way that he behaves. Because when my husband's mom got remarried, there was no infidelity there on her part or anything bad. I mean, she was single trucking along on her own with two young boys for years before Mm -hmm. she met that guy. And I had asked my husband, like, well, did he ever hit her? Was he a drunk? Like, you know, was there a reason that you didn't like him? He's like, no. And that is key. You've got some kids that even if the step parent did never do anything to them and treat the bio parent like gold, Mm -hmm. they're hurt and they're broken. And they don't want to have a relationship because it means that their bio parents will never get back together. And that's right. Right. So I think some of that selfishness from my stepson comes innately from my husband because Mm -hmm. he, he didn't treat us like he didn't, after the mom died, he didn't try to have a relationship with the stepdad at all. And I had found out the stepfather had lived like 20 minutes from us at one point. Wow. Yeah. And you've got a perfect point there. A lot of times it's not the step parent as a person that the stepkids don't like it's what they represent. Exactly. Yeah. You said this is your second marriage. Yes. And that you and your current husband are trying to conceive. Yes. So if you have a baby next year, that baby's sibling or half sibling would be 28 years old. Yes. That is a huge gap. I know. That's crazy. You you see all these older people having kids now, you know, I'm 39, he's 53. And and I'm paying the piper now, right? You know, I married an older guy. I waited. Some of this is his fault. Some of it's my fault from what the doctors can tell us, but they really don't know why. It's just kind of one of those things is what happens when you wait. But Lori, if I died tomorrow, I did everything I wanted to do. I have seen the world. I have done some pretty amazing things. Unfortunately, and fortunately, because it gives you perspective, was knee deep in an actual war. I'm an OEF vet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had a wild ride. And this kid, I mean, that'll be it for me. Yeah. Did you not want children with your first husband? We weren't together long enough. I got married really young. Also, too, we had been together for five years, but married less than a year. Um, I actually wanted an annulment, but the state of Georgia wouldn't allow it. So, or I was going to, it was going to take like a year. And I didn't have a year because there had been infidelity and he had his future wife pregnant. So I I wanted out of that marriage as soon as possible. Well, yeah, I don't blame you at all. So I took the divorce, but I really don't even talk about it that much because it should have been an annulment. Yeah. So it it just didn't even happen. (laughs) Basically. Yeah. And I waited a good 10 years before I got married again. So I I had a lot of time to think and decide what I wanted and how it was going to work out. My husband was a lot quicker. I mean, he was divorced and like we met a couple months later and then we weren't living together. We dated long distance for like a year, Mm -hmm. but I mean, he was not single for nearly as long as I was. So I don't think he knows how to be single. Right. Yeah. So what's one piece of advice that you would give? I know you've given a lot of great advice, but if you had to break it down to the most valuable piece of advice that you feel like you could give someone going into a blend, what would that be? (sighs) Going into a blend? Mm -hmm. Fresh. They don't know anything about how the relationships are going to be with the stepkids, nothing. They're dating a guy, things seem great right now, and they're planning to get married. I would really, because there were indicators, right? Mm -hmm. I would really, it's not just about what a good parent that person is. My husband is a wonderful father. That's not what it's all about. Mm -hmm. You need to look at the relationship that he has with you, with his kids, and then how that's going to look like together. Does he encourage group outings together or he or she, you know, because it could be a step dad. Does he or she encourage group outings? When the kids come over, do they dote on them? Does that bio parent dote on them a hundred percent? And like, you're just chopped liver. Mm -hmm. If you see that type of stuff run, because I would not get a divorce over this, like, but I've had to do a lot of soul searching and a lot of work on my own and things could be a lot better than they are if my husband would do what he needed to do. So if you don't want to go through everything I'm going through, you really need to look at 
not just what a good parent that person is, but how they are trying to cultivate the relationship. How how good are they of a, I don't want to say referee, but middleman. Mm -hmm. Are they a good middleman between the children and you? Because if they're not, it won't get better after you blend. It will get worse. I mean, you need to also look at yourself because a lot of moms on here are bio moms themselves. Mm -hmm. What kind of relationship do you have with your kids? And how are you going to cultivate that with your spouse? Because that's not fair to that man either. Like if you dote on your kids and don't make them do the dishes and don't clean their room and your spouse likes a clean home, but it's a disaster when the kids come over the weekend, that's not going to work for him either. Mm -hmm. So I sympathize for everyone because everyone on here gets, well, you knew what you were getting into. God, if I have to hear that one more time, I'm going to scream. Uh You knew what you were getting into. Well, yeah, we did, but we didn't. You would expect that the same type of love and respect that you get from your husband and that wonderful relationship you have will extend to their the children. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. It's a whole nother ball game. So right. you really need to be watching. Now I get when you date, it takes a while to to you know get the kids involved because you know, you don't want it to be a revolving door. Like you want, you know, to get to, you're with someone for a little while before you bring the kids into it. Mm-hmm. But with that initial interaction, that's when you should start the clock look at how they're cultivating that relationship. Do they allow outright disrespect? Do they, for themselves, for you, are they trying to, you know, cultivate a relationship? Do they have a positive, and they never do, but do they have a positive relationship with the bio mom? And if they don't have a positive relationship, are they managing it accordingly? Are you getting drunk phone calls and texts on your husband's phone at midnight? I've been Mm -hmm. through that. Just watch what you're getting into, and I highly would recommend if you're not going to go get therapy with your spouse, at least like search the forums because those have been really helpful for me. Like there are so many women out there that are in the same position I am. And you don't feel so alone because I felt alone. Um, And that's how I found you, Lori. Like I love your guys' posts. They're awesome. Well, thank you. I'm glad that you found us. I am too. Like they make me smile. Even the ones that aren't like pertinent to me, like I still chuckle like, yeah, I'm so glad they're not, at least he's not a minor, you know, because, and that's another thing too, is that, I never wanted to marry somebody with kids, but my excuse was they're older. They're older. They're already established. You know, it won't be that big of a deal. It has been a challenge even when they're not minors, particularly if they live in the same state or live down the street or you're financially supporting them in a way, all of those impact your life. Yeah. It's just a different type of challenge. Yeah. But they're still his kid. Cause like when I grew up and hopped out of the nest and like didn't ever come back. You know, I visit stuff, but you know, I wasn't getting checks cut to me or anyone paying for my bills, you know, when I was 18, 19, 20, 25, mm-hmm. 26, you know? So you kind of assume that their upbringing will be like yours. Nope. I mean, you see parents now supporting their kids in their mid thirties. I know. So watch that because it will not change when you come along. It will mm-hmm. just get worse. And a lot of times we come into this and we think, oh, he only sees his kids every other weekend, and that's great. He's going to want to spend so much time with them, and his focus is going to be on them. And you know what? It should be. If he's only seeing his kids four days a month, there's nothing wrong with him being dedicated to them during that time. However, be careful because that can quickly turn into he completely ignores me and acts like I don't exist when these kids are here. And that's not right. Right. That's not right. No one should feel ignored. Right. No one should feel sidelined. No one should feel uncomfortable in your own home. And I have felt all those feelings Mm -hmm. and it sucks. Yes, it does. And there's a way for the dad, and we're using the dad here, to show his kids that attention, but not exclude you. It goes back to that guilty father syndrome, Lori. Yes. I mean, that's, that's a tough nut to crack. It is. It is. And, you know... If you've listened to our podcast, you know, I've got guilty parent syndrome when it comes to my son. And there's a lot of times that he does things right before he's getting ready to go to his dad's that I choose not to fight with him about because I don't want him to go to his dad's right after we get in a fight. Oh, yeah, because then dad's the hero. Right. I get it. And it's hard. And then a lot of my guilty parent syndrome comes from how I was treated with my mom. My mom was very strict, not very loving, 
we could even say mean and hateful sometimes. And I don't want my son to feel that way about me. Yeah. So going back a little bit, my husband's father was not in his life at all for like years and years and years. And they only kind of reconnected like much later on in life. My husband overcompensates because his father was never there for him. A lot of that guilty parent syndrome comes from his dad not being around. So he feels he's got to be there for everything, even the bad behavior. Yes, you're right. So it's not just as simple as guilty parent syndrome because they're afraid that the kid's going to go live with them by a mom or they're not going to come see them or they're not going to like them. A lot of times it has to do with our own childhood. Yeah, they're trauma triggers is what it is. You're reenacting like unresolved trauma from your childhood. Yeah, exactly. Well, Heather, it has been great having you as a guest on our podcast. I am so sorry about the losses you have experienced. And I am thankful that you had those five years with your stepson because he may have felt more love from you than he ever had before. Well, thank you so much for that. And I am grateful for the five years that I got too. And um, I know that he would be so excited to have a little brother or sister. And you know what? I am of the belief that he will see that child before you do. You're going to, you're making me cry. Well, I don't mean to make (laughs) you cry. It's, it's true. In my heart, I feel like that's true. I feel like that he's still a part of your life and he's going to always be. Yeah. That's kind of how I look at it. Yeah. Well, I wish you the absolute best and do not give up on trying to have a baby because it will happen. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're going to just keep on trucking. But thank you so much for having me as a guest. Like this is my first podcast. It was a really wonderful, enriching experience. And I'll try to post more on your on your Instagram and stuff, because if there are women out there that want to connect or that are local that want to have a cup of coffee and talk about stuff like I would love that. And uh, there, you know, stepmoms need to be on the same team and be together and try to get, you know, it it helps to talk about it. And I think a lot of stepmoms particularly try to do it alone. And that's not, that's not always the best way. No, it's not. And they end up being in situations where they're depressed and even suicidal at times because they are trying to handle everything themselves. Yeah. Are you in Texas? I am. I'm in Dallas. We are having an event with Laura Petherbridge the end of April in Fort Worth. I have no idea how far apart that is. I I am here, and that's only an hour away. I'll be there. Okay, check it out. It's um, if you look at nachokids.com slash Fort Worth 2022. All righty. That would be great. Yeah, I'd love to meet you in person. Yes, yes. And I don't know if you've heard of Laura Petherbridge, but she's great, too. I love her to pieces. I don't, but I'll be sure to look her up. Yes, do that. Well, thank you again, and we wish you the absolute best. And keep in touch and let us know how things are going, and I hope your relationship with your older stepson improves. Well, thank you, and I I do too, and I do think in time it will. I just think that it's just going to take time. That's all it is, but I'm hoping for the best because disengagement's not supposed to last forever. It's just supposed to be a tool for a time frame, I'll say. Yeah, disengagement is to take the pressure off, and then... The other steps are a lot of what you've already went through where you're becoming more self-aware of things and, you know, self-reflection and learning to pause before you speak and thinking of how things can be different with your engagement with them. You know, the goal of Nacho Kids is to re-engage with the stepkids, if at all possible, in a better role. Correct. Yeah. And I think disengagement is a time really the most, like really to work on yourself and your feelings and how you're going to handle it from here on out. Right. And I think you're doing a great job. And I think you are an inspiration to very many. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you. And you have a great day. You too. Talk to you later. David, why do you make these recordings so stressful on me? You know, I have to edit them afterwards. It's not like I can post you all the crap you say. You said it's not. It's not. <laughs> See? See? I love you, honey. No, you don't, because you know I got a headache. Still love you. And you're intensifying it. Quit using big three-syllable words. (laughs) You did. (laughs) I love you. You said three. I love you. Hey. Hey. (laughs) Okay. Let's see. What do we have going on? 
in a few short weeks, we will be in Fort Worth, Texas with Laura Petherbridge and Melanie Anthony and a bunch of other people. I think Heidi Farrell's going to be there. I'm so excited. Mm-hmm. So if you would like to join us, check it out. Show www.nachokids.com slash Fort Worth 2022. And that's F-O-R-T for Fort. Yeah, not, not F-O-R-O-K. <sighs> F-O-R-O-K. O-R-O-K. <laughs> oh my gosh somebody help us save us well you know some people abbreviate fort as ft and mm-hmm. I, I just want them to know that it's f-o-r-t w-o-r-t-h 2022 good job okay david i'm done with you pay attention all right folks thanks for listening please join us next week when there's no telling what we'll say <laughs> We don't even know. (laughs) Remember, life is good. (laughs) Wing you, Nacho. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nacho Kids Podcast. Find us online at nachokids.com. Until next time, remember, life is good when you nacho.